Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Hoeksema, and I am the president of the grad student organization in the statistics department. And it is our pleasure tonight, along with the co-sponsoring um, organizations and departments, including the departments of statistics, political science, mathematics, and economics, the Center for Survey Statistics and Methodology, the Graduate and Professional Student Senate, and the Committee on Lectures. Um, I would like to welcome you to this talk by Nate Silver. And um, just to let you know, after the talk, there will be a reception with drinks and bars and cookies of some sort. So please feel free to stay and mingle afterwards. Um, so now, it is my pleasure to introduce Nate Silver. He is a graduate of the University of Chicago in economics, who was already celebrated among baseball fans for developing what is currently known as the most accurate system for forecasting how athletes and teams will perform. Um, he then, in 2007, turned to, to politics, where he launched the political website 538.com. And by the end of election night, he had predicted the popular vote within one percentage point, um, predicted 49 of 50 states' results correctly. And in addition to all these political accomplishments, um, he is also an analyst and writer for Baseball Prospectus, and he writes an Esquire column called The Data. So please welcome Nate Silver. All right, so I have to use that. Uh, well, thank you all for having me here. Everyone's been really friendly. I'm going to take a quick kind of pop, not pop quiz, but kind of poll survey first. Uh, who wants things uh, kind of on the more technical side? Who thinks technical is good? Okay, who thinks technical is, is bad, more kind of... Oh, we need a recount. It's like Minnesota. Great. Um, okay, so we'll try and balance those two things so we go through the presentation today. But I'm really just going to talk about kind of what we were trying to accomplish, what I was trying to accomplish. I use the royal we a lot for 538 because it seems more important than it is. Um, but in 2008. So I'm going to talk about my motivation for starting the website first, and then that second bullet point is the more technical side of things. Um, th then look at how we did and kind of what the experience has helped to teach me. Um, but the kind of ostensible reasons why I started 538 is because I wanted to improve public discourse about polls, especially in the mainstream media. Um, you might think running a website about polls. I really like polls, and I, I don't. I have a pretty low opinion of most polls and you know many pollsters, I would say. Um, polls are not terribly accurate. They're not very well reported on. The standards of disclosure are not very good. Um, they're not really placed in any kind of context, and that was part of my frustration. I mean, you guys obviously are in Iowa here. Knowing, for example, that national polls in a primary mean next to nothing until Iowa has its caucus and New Hampshire has its primary. That's very obvious if you look at history, but it was kind of lost on you know, Chris Matthews and people like that, I think. Um, in fact, sometimes polls, like worse polls, sometimes tend to get more attention, what I call kind of the bad apple effect, um, where if you have two polls, one of which is good and normal and is like all the other polls, and the other one stands out for some reason, um, let's say, you know, McCain or Obama should be ahead by five points in Iowa. Everyone's kind of agreed. Then one poll comes out putting Obama 23 points ahead. You know, that'll get a lot of attention, but it's probably a bad poll. So sometimes the worst pollsters kind of get the most attention. Um, but, so we also want to create more accountability among, uh, among pollsters themselves. There's no one previously who kind of had significant traffic who was kind of being nonpartisan, saying which pollsters are actually any good which ones aren't. All the pollsters, of course, will tell you they're the best, but you know who really knows? Um, and also look at the election in terms of a probability where you say, well, we're not going to call the election today because it's going to happen many months from now, but look at it in terms of percentages. But really the reason I created it was because someone had to do it, and I thought I could do it right. Um, there were sites like Real Clear Politics we'll talk about that just kind of take averages of polls, but they're not doing anything very sophisticated. Nevertheless, they get a lot of traffic, so I thought maybe we can kind of build a better mousetrap this way, where it seemed like relatively obvious, interesting things they could be doing to do kind of <clears throat> serious analytics for politics and having, you know, covered baseball for, you know, five or six years and kind of 
watching how the media was very dumbed down with respect to how they talked about baseball, I thought the same thing might be possible in politics. Um, as I hinted at before, polls really aren't all that good on balance, although they have better years and worse years. Um, when you see a margin of error in a poll, plus or minus 3%, that assumes that all the fault is due to random chance alone, where if you have, you know, 3 million people in Iowa, I hope it's about right, um, and you're trying to, okay, pretty good, and you're trying to get, you know, a 500-person survey, through chance alone, you'll sometimes get a random sample of people who happen to be more Republican or more Democratic. That's called sampling error. But there, there's also error because the pollsters aren't doing things the right way, where they're sloppy, trying to get their work done too fast. That's methodological error. And there's time-based error. You know, if you take a poll today for the 2012 election, um, 2012 Iowa Republican Caucus, it might tell you a tiny bit, but not more than a tiny bit, not a lot more than random chance. So whether a pollster can be blamed for not foreseeing the future is debatable. Um, you know, polls are not intended to be predictive. They're intended to be reflective of a moment in time. Um, sometimes political time unfolds very quickly, where in New Hampshire, for example, we had lots of polls saying Obama was going to win New Hampshire after having won Iowa, and Hillary won instead, and kind of gave us this great primary season that lasted for months and months. I enjoyed it. Maybe people got tired of it. Um, but, you know, those polls were published, you know, on Monday morning, Tuesday morning in a local paper, had been conducted over the weekend. Well, things had changed by the time we got to Tuesday. Um, people had seen a debate where Hillary performed well, Obama didn't. Um, people had seen various kind of very dramatic moments involving both candidates. And so, you know, especially in primaries, people can change their opinion very fast. Um, and as a result of this, the average error of a poll in the 2008 primaries was about seven points. So they say the average margin of error is three points or two points. Really, it's at least twice that. General election polls, however, were, were much better. So the goal is to actually produce a forecast. It's not that difficult to say what will happen in an election held today. Um, you know, then you just kind of look at the polls, take an average, but to actually translate that into the future is a bit more involved, potentially. Um, so there's a six-step process. We'll go through each step kind of here. But if you see that chart, you can maybe get some idea where we're taking polls. Well, let me go through it here instead of cutting off my own. Okay. So step one is just to take an average of polls, but not a simple average. Take a, a weighted average. And we're looking at which polls, simply put, have been more accurate in the past. We also look at sample size. All else being equal, sampling more people is better than few, fewer, but it's not a catch-all. I mean, there are some polls that are so bad that you could survey every person in the country and they'd still miss by two points. Um, and how recent the poll is as well. You know, um, I don't believe in having arbitrary cutoffs. We say, well, polls from within the last week are good and those before then are not. Um, so we have kind of a half-life kind of function to diminish the weight of polls the further back in time we get. Um, so the accuracy data is compiled from all elections since 2000, so presidential, Senate, governor, um, presidential primaries. Sometimes it really is, I think, not the general election. That's kind of the easiest place to poll, right? Everyone kind of comes out and votes for president every four years. Most people vote along partisan lines. But primaries and caucuses are tough. For Senate races, where the candidates might not be quite as well known, can be a little bit tougher. Um, so this gets a little technical, but the key concept is to try and identify which part of the error is the pollster's fault, right, versus the part that is inevitable due to random chance alone. So we basically look at how accurate the polls are overall. One thing also, we do have to adjust for the fact that some races are easier to poll than others. For example, primaries, as we talked about, are much more difficult to poll than the general elections. So you don't want to punish a pollster for t uh, surveying tough races any more than you would punish a basketball team for playing a tough schedule. Uh, so we have kind of an NCAA power ratings type system um, to iterate error and find out, you know, what polls really, which polls really are kind of cr uh, creating value or, or are below average. And you see there's kind of a wide diversity. Actually, the, the top pollster, this is based on ratings through the primaries this year, um, is a Des Moines-based pollster called Seltzer and Company. Um, but you see, they add about three quarters of a point of error versus what theoretically would be perfect. Um, whereas the worst pollsters might add 
five or six or seven points of error. Um, the Columbus Dispatch still kind of conducts a poll by by mail ballots, where they'll kind of send a ballot to all their subscribers, and they'll say, you know, fill it out, Ohio voter, return your ballot, and it's just not very accurate. Zogby Interactive does polling on the internet, um, which has not really evolved to the point where it really tells you more than a random guess. So those polls are not very good, but you see there are a lot of pollsters, and there's a pretty wide diversity of how effective they are. Um, so we use something called effective sample size, which is that we, we take the equivalent sample size you would have if the pollster did everything right, which means in practice you might have a pollster, a poll of 600 people, but it might have an effective sample size of 200 because of the mistakes the pollster makes. So again, this gets kind of technical here, but the key thing is that we're trying to balance out how recent the poll is with the kind of information it gives us. And you know, we will, uh, if we have lots of polls from the same firm, like a tracking poll, for example, and we'll kind of combine them and treat them all as one um, big poll and then diminish the weights accordingly. But in addition to seeing which polls are the most accurate, you kind of see this here where that's the output basically. That kind of dictates how much we weight the polls. Some polls also lean toward one candidate or the other. Um, this is what's called a house effect. Um, we shouldn't necessarily confuse this with being having like a partisan bias. For example, you know, it's not necessarily true that Fox News has a Republican lean and vice versa, um, or the New York Times a Democratic lean, although it happens that it does. Uh, but it's just based on different legitimate disagreements about how you actually conduct a poll. Um, the big question in polling is really who's going to turn out to vote. In some ways, it's more difficult to say who's going to vote or not, especially in a case like the Iowa caucus, where it's actually quite difficult to come out and vote. You have to devote two hours of time. Um, so different polls might have more or less aggressive likely voter models. Um, they also do different things, like they push undecided voters. Some polls who say, I'm undecided, and the pollster will say, no, really, who are you voting for? Come on. Um, and some polls will kind of let you only kind of want people who are highly decided on their decision. So all these things can affect the outcome in different ways. Um, and you see here, for example, uh, you know, you have clear polls where you maybe have, if you have two polls in Pennsylvania, one poll might have Obama ahead by 12, one might have him ahead by three. You know, that's actually fairly predictable based on how these different pollsters tend to come out. Now, fortunately, it's pretty easy to correct for, you know, if you know a pollster always leans three points toward the Democrat, you can just subtract three from that total. That's basically what we do. Um, another problem is what I call timing bias, where especially early on, not all the states are polled at regular intervals. You might get you know one poll every few weeks in certain states, and also sometimes polls happen during random events. You know the conventions we have what are called convention bounces, where all of a sudden you get a big commercial, which is you know the equivalent of about a hundred million dollars in free airtime for that party, and lo and behold, people react to that free advertising, and in the days following a convention, sometimes the weeks following are more inclined to support the candidate, the nominee of that party. Um, so what we try and do is take lots of different poll units, is what I'm calling them. So look at the same state polled by the same firm. So if Seltzer and Company polls Iowa, we look at what they found was happening in Iowa on September 1st, and then again on October 1st. And from that, we can make inferences about you know, the overall movement in the election. If Obama is gaining three or four points in all these different polls across the country, we can infer that that's a pretty strong trend. Um, lo and behold, or you know, sometimes though you'll have things where he's moving forward in the western states, but you know, losing ground in the south, and this method can do that too, although it gets a little bit convoluted. But uh, the technical term is called a lowest regression, where you have a lot of data points where it tries to make all these inferences about where the polls are headed. Um, also, another thing we're trying to account for is that we might not always have polls in a particular state, um, especially early on, or the polling data might be bad. We don't want to have to be slave to a bad poll. Um, so in addition to doing the polling data, we also have a regression model, um, which is based on demographic variables. Um, in the primaries, we didn't use polls at all. Because we had in the primaries all the different elections happening sequentially, so you have Iowa, then New Hampshire, then South Carolina, 
you had a tremendous amount of data by the middle of the process about how different types of Democrats and Republicans would vote in different areas. You could be very, very detailed about, you know, pinning down like, you know, well, you know, Catholics might vote one way if they're Hispanic Catholics, but another way if this and that. Um, you know, so for Indiana and North Carolina, for example, um, we predicted that Obama would have a very good night in North Carolina, winning by about 14 points. This was a bad time for him during the campaign when uh, Jeremiah Wright was happening and, you know, all that stuff. Um, and the polls actually had Hillary very close within maybe three or four or five points. And lo and behold, the regression model, just based on the fact that, hey, Obama won Virginia by 20 points. Virginia's a lot like North Carolina. He won South Carolina by 20 points. Um, that turned to be a lot better than the polls themselves. And so, you know, we kind of combine that kind of information with the polls to create our estimates. So there are all kinds of variables we look at. Um, the ones that tended to be most important this year were, you know, obviously John Kerry's vote. Fundraising is a great metric. Um, if you don't know anything else about an election, you know who's raising money. If someone's raising money early on, you know that means they have enthusiasts on the ground who are going to knock on doors, who are going to be voters, who are going to help them build a field organization. Um, <clears throat> Obama, even in the general election, had trouble in states where Clinton had won a higher percentage of the primary vote. People kind of forgot about that theme once we got into September and October and Obama was winning, but you still saw that to some extent. Um, you know, education and religion were also important variables in this election. The biggest predictor of people voting for Obama, really both in the primaries and the general election, was education levels. People sometimes confused it for income levels, but it's not really. Someone who had a good education might have a working class job would tend to be uh, an Obama voter. Someone who might be less educated but had a wealthy, well-paying job would tend to be a McCain voter. And now we're starting to get to where we really want to go, <clears throat> which is to predict what's going to happen in November, which means we have to allocate out undecided voters and also figure out how robust our current estimate is. If you have a candidate with a 10-point lead in June, odds are you can show this based on the historical track record that that lead will not hold up later on. In fact, here's a chart that kind of shows this. If you have a 15-point lead 300 days before an election, on average, you go back through history, you only win by about five points. Um, it's really only until after Labor Day, and you kind of see those curves tilting upward at the end after about you know, 60 days or so, that's Labor Day when you finally start to get people actually tuning in. I mean, people, polls don't move for no reason. They move because people are watching the conventions, which happen usually in late August, um, or watching debates, which begin in September, or their vice presidential picks. Um, so only when the public is engaged do polls really kind of tell you a lot about who's going to win. You know, if you have a candidate who's up by 20 points, you know, a year in advance, it means really not very much at all. Um, with undecided voters, at first I allocated them 50-50. Eventually we kind of looked at what happened in the primaries. One thing about the primaries is that the polls were not only inaccurate, but they were inaccurate in predictable ways, where consistently um, the primaries missed low on Obama's numbers in the southern states. Consistently they missed low on Hillary's numbers in the northeast. Um, and so we tried to make some inferences about what was kind of driving these changes. Maybe they were kind of underestimating the number of of African-American voters, for example. Uh, maybe there was a Bradley effect, which we'll talk about a bit in a minute. Um, but anyway, we had to allocate out the undecideds. But the key is really in the simulations, where you take the projection for every individual state, and then you simulate it 10,000 times. This is a way to account for all the error and the variance in the forecasts. Um, what we can do is kind of go back in time and figure out how accurate polls have been at a given point in the past. So this is kind of showing this doesn't have 2008, but you can not really tell from that whole big mess of dots there on the left. But on the right, this kind of gives you the average margin of error based on the number of days until the election. Um, kind of like what we were talking about before. You see, even on election day, the polls are not perfect, but they still tend to miss by about two points on average um, because some events happen too late for them really to be recorded in the polls. So we talked about in New Hampshire, you know, in 1980, Ronald Reagan had only a small lead over Jimmy Carter in the polls. Um, they had a debate very, very late in the campaign. Carter had not wanted to debate Reagan because he was an inferior debater. And when they did debate, Carter lost, and Reagan wound up winning the election 
in a landslide. That didn't show up in the polls. It happened kind of too late to have that momentum really reflected. Um, the other thing that's difficult about this is trying to figure out the relationship between movement in state polls and movement in national polls. Um, you can't assume that all states move independently of one another. States like Minnesota and Wisconsin, which are very similar geographically and demographically, are going to move in the same direction, whereas Minnesota and New Mexico might not. Um, unfortunately, until fairly recently, really until 2004, um, there was not very comprehensive polling data at all at the state level. We might have you know, one poll that would come out in the state at Labor Day and one on Election Eve, and that might be all you got, unless you were in a very big state like Ohio or Florida or California. So what I did is to borrow something I used from baseball, uh, for my baseball forecasts, um, which is we're looking, using what's called the nearest neighbor analysis. So we're taking a whole bunch of measures of a state and seeing which states are most similar to one another. Um, so you see here, like MI, Michigan, and Ohio have a very high score, you know. Um, demographically, they're, they're almost identical. Whereas, you know, there's almost no relationship between, say, Georgia and Massachusetts. There's actually a negative relationship there. Um, some states, states that tend to be swing states like Ohio or Missouri are like a lot of other states. They're kind of bits and pieces of what you might see all around the country. Whereas, uh, you know, states like New Mexico or West Virginia or Florida even are, are very kind of unique, where you don't have the same Cuban population anywhere in the country but Florida, um, or the same elderly population. You don't have the same um, circumstance like you have in New Mexico, where half the population is Hispanic. Um, so states like that kind of tend to march to their own drummer. So the key implication of this is what I call tipping point states, and it's the state most likely to alter the outcome of an election. Not necessarily the closest state. Um, if you have a blowout election, the closest states this last year were, were North Carolina, Indiana, and Missouri. Um, that doesn't mean they were the most important. Obama won them, but you know, North Carolina was worth was his 360th electoral vote. He didn't need that. He only needed you know 269, 270 rather to win. Um, so it's really the states that are kind of closest to the median states, like this year, Ohio and Florida, as always, but also states like Colorado and Virginia that were the most important tipping point states. Um, also, there's kind of a field here, which I guess you can call electoral portfolio theory, where you probably want a diverse range of states. For example, you know, you're probably not going to win Georgia unless you've won, if you're a Democrat, unless you've won North Carolina. Um, Georgia is kind of like North Carolina, but just a little bit more evangelical, a little bit more difficult for a Democrat to win. Likewise, you probably won't win North Carolina unless you've won Virginia. Um, so, you know, one thing this kind of system would advise, essentially, the Obama campaign is that don't spend a lot of resources in Georgia, because you won't win that unless you've won North Carolina. And by the way, you won't win North Carolina unless you've won Virginia. And if you've won Virginia, you probably already won the election. You don't need those extra votes. So you want uh, a lot of different strategies for winning, where if something goes wrong with one demographic group, um, it won't kind of ruin your whole chance of victory. <clears throat> so here are some examples of that, where this is kind of, I think on election eve, the states that our map thought was most important um, obviously, if you look at things in terms of tipping point states, it's one thing, but some states are more expensive than others. Um, Florida might be really important, but also it has 16 TV markets. It's kind of hard to buy TV time down there. Um, so you might kind of get a better per capita, per dollar investment in a state like Nevada, which is still very important, um, but isn't nearly as expensive. You can just kind of blanket Las Vegas, and that's all you have to do. Or you know, a state like New Hampshire, always gets a lot of attention because it's tiny. Um, New Hampshire's actually picky because you have to buy the Boston TV market in part. Um, but you know, smaller states sometimes present better returns on your dollar. So that's the basic process. I know that was a little dry and technical. Um, but here's the fun part, which is kind of how we did. Um, so we called 49 out of the 50 states correctly. And I'm comparing us against uh, pollster.com, Real Clear Politics. They missed to each. Everyone really had a pretty good year. The election was very dramatic throughout, um, <clears throat> throughout kind of August and September um, and the first part of October when the economy was 
kind of falling apart and you had debates every few days. Um, but the last two weeks, it was kind of a lull where Obama maintained about a six or seven point lead. Most of the polling was pretty steady. And, uh, you know, I think people were still surprised, relieved that the polling turned out to be pretty good in election day when they had such a rough year in the primaries like we discussed. Um, but for the most part, you know, all the pollsters, all the aggregators did pretty well. Um, we also call all the Senate races correctly, assuming that Al Franken um, does eventually get seated in Minnesota, which looks pretty safe now. Um, and we perform better than predictions markets like Intray, where if you had kind of bet money based on our numbers, you would have you know, made money against kind of, um, it's not in Vegas, but kind of offshore gambling lines. <laughs> not that we advise use of our site in that way at all. Um, and really between us and Pollster.com, Pollster.com also does things kind of scientifically. If you've been to their site, they have kind of a very neat graphical way to present polling. Whereas Real Clear Politics is the simple one where they just kind of take an average of polls, not all polls, of polls they kind of like. Um, and you see there's really not a lot of difference if you look at kind of correlation with the 37 battleground states. It's all about the same. They're all very high. Um, the average error, we in polls toward about 2.4 points per poll. Real Clear Politics was about 2.7. That's like a little bit better, but not even um, statistically significant difference. Um, so we're, we're looking for kind of small advantages here, whether it's worthwhile or not um, to invest all this kind of <laughs> time and effort to get like an extra two tenths of a point. I don't know. You know, that's something we can debate. Um, but then again, I think maybe an election where you had more of a dramatic outcome at the end where it was more difficult to forecast, you might have seen more dramatic changes potentially. Um, in the Senate, for example, oh, by the way here, when you look at the kind of polling averages that missed by about 2.4 points, the average pollster themselves missed by maybe three and a half points on election day. So by taking an average, you do improve things a little bit, but there's still some randomness you can't really account for. Um, you know, an average helps some, but sometimes the errors in polls are correlated where everyone tends to miss, like in New Hampshire, in the same direction. In the Senate races, we see slightly larger differences, although pollster also did better than, than we are. In general, uh, the higher races on the ballot, the easier it is to poll because voters have more information. They're paying more attention. When you go on November 4th and cast your ballot, you probably know who you're voting for for president going in and Senate. Um, you probably don't know who you're voting for for you know, county commissioner necessarily, or, or dog catcher, or whatever else. It might be based on whose name you like, um, or who's kind of has a, you know, has a sign at, at the balloting place, or, you know, kind of who the local paper endorses. Um, so for that reason, you know, the Senate, you start to see a bit, first of all, the polls are less accurate in general, and so we're less accurate in reflecting them. But also you might see more difference between a smart, quote unquote, average like pollster dot com or like ourselves versus a dumb average like real clear politics. Um, so here's also where we kind of missed in different states. And you see this is not really a random pattern um, where Obama systematically kind of underperformed, especially this kind of Appalachian region of the country, um, West Virginia, Arkansas, Louisiana. By the way, red means states where he did worse than his polls, not necessarily states that he lost. Obama won Iowa, but he actually underperformed his polls here a little bit. Um, and blue are states where he performed better than his polls suggested beforehand. Um, so, you know, what's going on with those states right there in the middle southern part of the country, kind of the highlands region, as I call it? Um, maybe it is a, a regionalized kind of Bradley effect where people might say, well, we're not going to vote for a black, or they might say they're going to vote for an African American candidate, but they turn out that they're less than comfortable doing so. In fact, when they took, took exit polls in states like these, um, they actually asked people, was the race of the candidate a factor in your decision? And in some states like Louisiana, for instance, about 20% of McCain voters said yes. So those, those numbers were pretty high, actually, in terms of people whose vote might have been influenced by race. In the more urban states like California, New York, those numbers were 2 or 3%. Um, so there may have been regionally in parts of the country that are a bit um, poorer, or as I kind of call it, maybe more educationally impoverished, you might have had some kind of regional effects because of Barack Obama's race. On the other hand, in some other states, Obama actually did better than his polls. In particular, in the 16 states their campaign was targeting um, throughout the election, 
Um, they beat their polls by a, about a, a point. In every other state, they trail their polls by about half a point. So you can kind of see the effect right there of their ground operation. They had a better ground operation than McCain. Um, they had a lot more people knocking on doors and so forth. And so you kind of see a point and a half worth of advantage in states where they really were kind of going after um, voters on the ground. Remember the one state that we missed is Indiana? That was the state where McCain decided, I'm going to call Obama's bluff. Obama couldn't possibly win Indiana. Republicans win that state by 20 points every year. So he had no field operation, almost no advertising at all. Obama, because everyone from Chicago, your vote's not very important <laughs> in Chicago. You don't have to knock on doors there. So you go down to Gary Hammond, Indiana, if you don't go up to Wisconsin. Um, and they really kind of overperformed there in Indiana. So we talked about this a little bit, but does all the extra complexity really kind of help matters much? Um, maybe. I mean, I personally think part of the joy of this is in just kind of doing the work itself. I think you learn a lot more um, about something sometimes, looking for that extra 2% of advantage and might kind of, you know, launch you into some other interesting applications. Um, you know, but this was also a pretty easy election to forecast in terms of not having a lot of movement at the end. Um, and as I said before, you have large differences on the Senate side of things. So when you're looking at contests like primaries, like uh, elections to the House of Representatives, where you have complete surprises sometimes, when Jim Leach lost in Iowa in 2006, almost kind of no one saw that coming. Um, and also when you have forecasts far in advance of the election, um, the further out you are, the less accurate you are. Um, and other lessons learned, there's definitely lots of interest in sophisticated discussions about polling, um, whether it's from the media itself, whether it's from other blogs, obviously. Um, the pollsters, of course, are very interested. You saw that chart before. The pollster at the top, at the top of the list tended to contact me and said, well, thank you. You know, I'm happy. Can we help you in any way? And the ones at the bottom tended to contact me and said, you're a total hack. Who are you? Um, the ones in the middle were more <laughs> quiet. But the first people to, know, to notice the website really were people in the polling um, industry. And they tend to be very, I mean, it is scientific, but it's also, it's also an imperfect <laughs> science. I think, you know, if you read the website every day, you kind of discover. Um, the campaigns, of course, themselves have certainly some more than passing interest in this stuff as well. Um, really, that kind of, if you go back to the, the uh, too many slides. This is kind of really what they're interested in. They want to know, how are we going to spend our given dollars on a given day? We have to you know, send some field operatives out. We have you know, 30 minutes of John McCain's time. We can do three local interviews. What state should those go in? Campaigns want to answer those questions every day. So applications like these are really what they care about. Oops. Um, you know, to get into the more kind of media side of things, uh, you know, web content doesn't need to be dumbed down. You know, our content was pretty, was pretty technical, um, was pretty smart, I like to think. Um, you know, as fun as it is to play around on, like, Twitter and stuff like that, sometimes you need more than 180 characters to express a thought, I think. Um, you know, one thing about the web is that it's much easier to kind of find uh, your audience, I think. Um, and so I think you don't necessarily need a site that kind of appeals to the lowest common denominator. You need a site that will appeal, be highly appealing to people who, you know, who think like you. Who, you know, and the first thing you want to do is kind of create a product that you would like yourself and that you think there's a need for in the market instead of trying to be you know, derivative about what you do. Um, and also, statistics can sell, but they can't sell themselves. You have to you know, hopefully write well, like the graphic design we did, well, by no means world class. We at least were kind of cognizant of trying to make it look like a reasonably sharp site. We have a lot of graphics and maps. Um, you know, also, even people who might not really be kind of statistics people, um, there's still a benefit to enhancing kind of your site's operation, its brand, by appearing knowledgeable, or, well, not appearing well, by being knowledgeable, hopefully, about statistics, um, by having that kind of depth and looking like you're doing kind of real analysis. I mean, you know, one thing I found Fulfilling is that you know we could actually conduct an experiment, a statistical experiment, and it would be some original kind of content. It's not just kind of words. It's not just kind of writing like a million other blogs are about the election. It's actually kind of you know creating a finding that no one else may have seen before, and so it's kind of seems to me like a form of of reporting almost, or at least of kind of original kind of proprietary content 
where, I mean, there are, are brilliant polemicists on different blogs and brilliant writers. Um, and there are some blogs that do get actually, they actually are journalistic and trying to get real information. But for the most part, you know, it's kind of very recycled. And I think, you know, having the statistical grounding where we're just kind of doing a bunch of experiments kind of in real time um, helps kind of keep the blog a lot, a lot fresher and more interesting. Um, but that's the end of the kind of prepared remarks. I, I'm going to leave some time for, for questions now, I think. Oh, did you want to? Yeah, in the front. I mean, not really, because polls can diverge from election day outcomes for any number of reasons. You know, they can diverge because there was a big event that happened at the last minute. They can diverge uh, uh, because the polls were bad, because there was like a Bradley effect and so on. You know, I mean, there was a lot of ambiguity about who would actually kind of show up and turn out in this election. The weather can affect turnout in different states. Uh, so, you know, it would be hard to actually infer that it was like voter fraud specifically versus kind of other sorts of things. If you looked at individual county data, you might kind of get something. We could see if there were anomalies in how certain precincts voted and so forth. You know, we tried to do some kind of forensic work on Minnesota where you had a recount and try and see, you know, all these ballots were being challenged by both campaigns, made it very hard to figure out what was going on. But you could kind of go precinct by precinct and see, well, which candidates or which, you know, precincts had ballots that weren't challenged, how the total shift there and so forth. But I mean, voter fraud, I think sometimes people are, I mean, people don't realize on the one hand how many votes are not counted <laughs> every year. Um, and it's not necessarily because of fraud, but because this technology is imperfect. Like the punch card ballots, like the type they use in Florida, about 2% of people go in thinking they've cast a legal ballot and it doesn't get counted because they've, you know, they've marked the ballot incorrectly in some ways. Um, and that's kind of millions of voters every year. It's getting better than it used to be, the kind of SAT-style bubble ballots, optical scan they're called, are actually fairly good. In theory, a, a computer will never make a mistake of tabulation, but you can't audit it, and so you never really know. Um, but, you know, things are getting a little bit more standardized and better. If you'd had a standardized voting system in Florida in 2000, Al Gore probably would have won, no matter what that technology was. But what happened is you had, in the richer, more Republican counties, you tended to have optical scan ballots, which missed fewer votes than punch cards do, and no matter how much you kind of look at hanging chads and everything else, you're just still going to be a lot more inclined to make a mistake on a ballot like that. Um, if you had uniform voting standards in Florida, you would have had a different, I think, president in 2000. Oh, oh cool, okay. Moving out of kind of election season, you've been kind of lucky, I think, to have a few, uh, few polls and data sets in uh, runoffs going on, um, but moving into kind of the normal politics season, what's the role of data in 538's continuing reporting? What's the role of being in the White House press room? How does it go forward? Is its focus still on polls, data, and running those little experiments, or where's it going? I think, I mean, more on data than on polls, I think. Uh, you know, I think outside of election seasons, polls are pretty boring for the most part. I think like presidential approval ratings are kind of tell you something, but it's like not the most interesting, interesting thing to look at necessarily. Um, but we try and focus on, you know, certain themes we think we can address well. Um, the controversy over like the torture memos, there's just like not really good angle there <laughs> that, you know, that we can latch on to. Um, but when there's the healthcare debate, we can look at the rates of uninsured in different states and look at how different senators are positioning themselves on the issue. You know, we have posts coming out on, you know, climate change where we are trying to kind of guess um, how many jobs might be threatened by, you know, a carbon tax, for example, versus how many, you know, lives might be saved in different kinds of states and things like that. Um, I mean, there's a whole kind of oyster full of data and with kind of a background I have in economics, most of the contemporary debates about health care, about the environment, about the budget, and the stimulus kind of have that kind of grounding. I think. Um, the other big area is to, is to predict how people will behave in the Congress. Um, I mean, guess what? You know, the people whose votes most, are most important 
in even or odd numbers years rather are the people who are in you know in the senate chamber and in the house of representatives and so if you can kind of try and say what makes a certain senator vote a certain way on a bill based on the characteristics of themselves or their district or whatever else then that's another area that we might try and approach can you say something about how you pulled the data together for your website from the different the, you must have used a lot of different sources yeah i mean a lot of it was just kind of scanning through you know google news and stuff like that for different polls and also because there are other sites that do this um, we would all kind of copy off <laughs> off one another to some extent where you know real clear politics will post polls and we steal theirs and they steal ours and vice versa um, but also you would have especially toward the end some um, pollsters will send you the links themselves and you their PDF. Um, I mean, they love this stuff, you know, except the ones we rate really poorly. Um, because, you know, that gets them a ton of incoming traffic, you know. In fact, we talked a little bit earlier uh, about how there are kind of perverse incentives here to just kind of get a poll out that will get report on, on the web. Um, so, you know, who knows? I mean, there are a couple of pollsters, not well-known ones, but I have suspicions that we listed them and they just kind of put a web page up somewhere with some numbers on it and never actually conducted a poll. There's kind of no way uh, to tell necessarily. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I was just kind of searching Google News and um, stealing from other people <laughs> and having people mail things to us directly. Maybe you've done this already, but assume for a minute that your audience is a group of pollsters. And the question is, how do we improve the selection of the people that we ask about, uh, both in primaries and then somewhat differently in, in general elections. Uh, so what do you have to recommend to pollsters, assuming that most of them would like to be more accurate? Well, I think for one thing, a lot of pollsters want to, you know, they don't want to spend money to do their polls, and they want to get their polls out quickly. I think uh, if you try and conduct a flash poll in a particular evening, it's kind of hard to get a representative sample of people on the phone. You know, I mean, literally, um, you know, there was the example of kind of the floods that you guys had in Iowa here last summer. You know, there are some polling firms that uh, would conduct kind of one-night polls every Tuesday night, and guess what? Around that time, you had some really funny-looking results in Iowa. Well, no surprise, people had kind of other things on their minds here. They weren't going to take a poll. You know, if you conduct a poll where there's a big Monday night football game, you might not get... <laughs> enough men in your sample, you know. If it's Dancing with the Stars or something, you might have the opposite problem. Um, so, you know, having the polls be in the field for longer, which is more expensive, I think is definitely worthwhile, unless you're really, really brushing up against the deadline of the election. Um, calling cell phone numbers is more expensive, um, slightly more expensive, but people should do that as well. There are more and more people um, who don't have landlines at all or don't use their landlines very commonly. Um, and so really, polls just have to stop being <laughs> Cheap. I mean, there are too many polls right now, you know, um, where by the end of the campaign you had eight different national tracking polls and you had, you know, roughly two dozen polling firms that were active to some extent across regions or states. Um, you know, we don't need that many. We need, we need a few more good ones and a few less kind of random duplicative ones. You kind of mentioned in passing with maybe a little bit of tongue-in-cheek about like in-trade and those kind of things. Yeah. But could you talk about those a little bit more? And are those popular science loves in trade and they, you know, predict when we're going to Mars and stuff like that with them. Um, um, and then one other quick question. Mm -hmm. Do you play poker? I do. I, I do. Well, I used to play poker. Are you any good? Yeah. I mean, I, I used to, I was never that good, but like there was a time um, in the poker world where everyone else was just really bad. And so being merely not good, I could make a lot of money. But, you know, then people got good because they got sick of losing money, and I didn't get any better. Um, but about in-trade, I, I think prediction markets are fascinating. From what I've seen, they still kind of do funny things a lot of the time. I mean, part of it is for a market to be actually liquid, it has to have quite a few people participating in it. Um, you know, just having a few thousand active traders might not really do it. So you would see kind of major events during the campaign where it, you know, some news would break, and then in-trade wouldn't react until, you know, an hour later. They also have, like, trading fees that are very large relative to the size of the contracts, and so that kind of tends to discourage it from truly kind of calibrating the market. I mean, obviously, I think they, they have a ton of potential. I think the lesson with something like this is you can maybe, if you really are 
really careful, you can maybe kind of beat those markets. Um, but even so, they were pretty smart for the most part. It's hard to say because, you know, we were at the point where we could probably move the trading markets to some degree. Um, you know, I think what you really would want is to have, you know, a lot of different sites. I wouldn't want this personally. You know, it would be bad for my bottom line. But if you had a bunch of different sites like 538 that were active in kind of elections forecasting, I think it might be kind of a growth area a little bit for, like, gambling and so forth, where political futures... Um, and, you know, some of these markets, there's a market called the Iowa Electronic Markets, which are kind of a legal version of Intrade. There's another kind of new firm that launched. So some of this stuff might actually be legal to do where, you know, you can actually hedge against political risk. Obviously, if you're a, you know, big oil company, you probably would prefer that John McCain had won the election, but you could actually kind of hedge against that in the markets. And so it's something to watch. But I think right now um, they should not, I mean, they should be taken seriously, but not taken as being gospel. Sometimes they do, they do stupid things. How much of your research have you done on outside influences affecting the polls? The reason I ask this question is I could have predicted outcome of election before President, Obama, before President Obama actually declared for the presidency because the media was touting him as our next president. And once he had won the media, he had won the general election. Well, I... Uh Maybe when he went, but I mean, Obama wasn't doing that well in the press like last September, or you know, September, October 2007. Um, I mean, at that point, the whole narrative was that Hillary Clinton was inevitable and so forth. I mean, I think media kind of definitely, there is such a thing as momentum. I think the media kind of creates momentum where a small kind of lead can become a larger lead and it becomes harder to maybe catch up. Um, <clears throat> and I think in general also that the media was very fond of Obama for sure. Um, but by no means did it always kind of work in his favor. I think kind of, you know, in parts of the primary process where Hillary was seen as inevitable, it hurt him during the Jeremiah Wright stuff, which was worth covering. It was a story, but maybe was overblown. It hurt him. I thought some of the kind of adulation for Sarah Palin was overdone, just as some of the um, kind of dislike of Sarah Palin and the sarcasm toward her later on was overdone. Um, but I think the media kind of takes small and random events and turns them into big events. Um, but I don't know if it kind of favors um, systematically kind of one candidate or, or another. Hi. Over here. Hi. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of off topic, but um, I noticed on your website that you've been kind of keeping track of some of the supporters for same-sex marriage. I was wondering if you had any more thoughts on kind of the numbers of where you think that's going to go. Well, you know, uh, it depends on what part of the country you're in, but it's one of the few issues where you've actually seen a very predictable trend, where every year it kind of gains about a point and a half or two points, um, and it's happening very slowly. It's not a dramatic game by any means, and there have been some setbacks. For example, when Massachusetts, when the court um, first all permitted same-sex marriage, I think in 2003, you saw a slight kind of tick downward in the numbers, but for the most part, you know, what you're seeing is generational differences, where people, by and large, under the age of 40 are okay with it, by and large, under the age, over the age of 40 are not, you know, with, with lots of exceptions on both sides. Um, but as you kind of, you know, cycle some of those older voters out of the electorate and they're replaced with kind of newer voters, you kind of see that changing very slowly. Um, that's different than something like abortion, where there isn't a big generational split, where young people and older people feel about the same way on abortion, those numbers have been the same for, for years and years. They've been, you know, kind of 50, 45, um, with 5% undecided for, for years and years and years. But things like gay marriage, you do kind of see a steady trend. Of course, if something happens, like you do have the Supreme Court take up a case, that could obviously kind of change things. But I think if you kind of have the organic process where you have, I mean, the state of New York right now, there are polls out today saying, a majority of people in New York support same-sex marriage, which is not surprising. It's New York. Uh, you wouldn't have that right now in Iowa, and you certainly wouldn't have it in Alabama <laughs> or something like that. But, you know, it's, I think it's relatively predictable based on what part of the country you're in and kind of how many years you project in the future, kind of what the trajectory might, might be. Well, let's thank Nate again for coming to speak today.
Please feel free to stay for punch and cookies and bars in the back. If you guys have more questions, he'll be around mingling for a few minutes. So thank you for coming. <laughs>